for you and um, a fantastic attendance as well. So thank you all for joining us today on this program. Um, in 2022, people are eager to reconnect and to travel and to be taken to special places so they can uh, create new memories uh, after what we've been through. And the city by the bay is known as a beacon of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Alaska Airlines is proud to be launching this series showcasing our neighborhoods, our small businesses, and also the culture that we have here in San Francisco. So in this program, Alaska Airlines presents One World, Many Flavors, A Taste of Italy, the third in our six-part webinar series uh, celebrating the cuisines of um, China, Mexico, today Italy, uh, next month uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, and India. Um, and our small businesses that play a big part in uh, identifying these cultures to our residents and visitors. So our panelists will share their background story, explain the importance of food to their culture, and tell us about their signature dishes and their experience as a small business in San Francisco. In today's forum, we'll be featuring a curated collection of Italian restaurants. We'll be highlighting some legacy and some new business models as well. And remember to stay till the end because we'll be announcing the winner of two round trip tickets on Alaska Airlines. And for the individual that's um, attended all six uh, forums, we'll be announcing the grand prize winner for two first class round trip tickets on Alaska Airlines and no blackout dates. So make sure to attend every forum that we have um, for the next uh, series to be eligible to win those uh, tickets. Um, and of course, at the end of this program, we'll be announcing uh, some winners, uh, some gift certificates uh, to some of the participating restaurants that we're showcasing here today. So please stay till the end. So uh, my name is uh, Vasquez I am a small business advocate here in San Francisco. And as an immigrant from Greece, I'm all too familiar with the challenges and successes of running a small business. I actually had a design store in the Fillmore for uh, close to 20 years, um, and I had products from all over the world, but that really gave me um, a taste of doing small business in San Francisco. And what we like to do now with this agency that we have next to SF is we wanna highlight the faces, the stories of the small business community to um, residents, visitors, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you again, Alaska Airlines. So today, uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Taste of Italy program, which has been sponsored by Alaska Airlines. In this program, we are presenting a curated collection of restaurants that are helping to make our communities thrive. And before we begin our program, we have a few housekeeping rules, of course. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. So if you miss something, if you wanna hear it again, if you wanna share it with friends, colleagues, family, uh, wait for the follow-up thank you email from us or you can go to our YouTube channel and all the other programs are listed there as well. So you guys are expert at this, but we've been on Zoom for over two years now. It's unbelievable. So you know what to do. If you have a question, drop it in the Q&A section. And uh, after all of the panelists present, um, we will ask the question to the panelists. Uh, you can direct it to particular businesses or you can have it as a mass question to everyone. So now uh, sit back, enjoy your favorite beverage, and let's get started with the program. I am proud to present my friend, uh, Franco Finn. He is the head of external affairs, community, and engagement at Alaska Airlines. Um, he's also a man about town and a true Renaissance man. So, uh, and he wears many hats, not today, I'm wearing the hat today, but next time. Uh, so please welcome to the stage, uh, Franco. Thank you, Voss, uh, and hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning us, tuning in on this beautiful uh, afternoon here in San Francisco. And this is just a taste, a taste of some flavors that I, I'm sure everyone is going to want to, you know, leave their uh, office space or wherever they are right now and actually go eat. And I'm going to always be hungry after these, uh, and we've done a lot of them already. And so we're so excited 
that we're doing this series. Of course, Alaska Airlines is a proud partner and uh, decided to partner with NextXF on this next uh, one because uh, it's all about the, the, the traveling and, and, and getting to explore places and regions of the world that actually Alaska Airlines can take you there as we are a part of the One World Alliance uh, since last March of 2021. And actually, uh, we are so excited about that because we can take you around the world. It's not just where Alaska Airlines flies uh, domestically, but we go international with our great One World partners. So we get into a little fun trivia uh, with that a little bit later, but Alaska is really, uh, you know, prides itself on being a members of the community, supporting small businesses. I'm a small business owner myself. Uh, I'm born and raised in San Francisco, and uh, I too have a business myself in uh, the heart of the mission uh, district uh, restaurant called Bruvino, which actually does some artisan pizzas, sandwiches, salads, and a great family event. So I cannot wait to uh, engage with our wonderful panelists here today to talk about their restaurants and their foods as we explore Italy. Italy has been one of my favorite, favorite places to visit. I actually spent three weeks all throughout Italy. Uh, and when my wife told me, we're going to spend three weeks in one country, I said, wait a minute, I want to travel to this, this. He goes, no, trust me, you're going to want to spend three full weeks in Italy. And that's not even enough. And so I can only imagine what we're going to be exploring today as we explore well, One World Many Flavors. And um, Alaska is really just happy to be a part of something like this because we want to diversify. We want to make sure that you can explore and see the world, um, hopefully on Alaska Airlines and our One World partners. And good news is no more masks too, by the way, if you've heard, that's the latest and greatest news. Uh, if you still want to go, uh, wear your masks. That's okay at the airports and, and on our planes. Safety is number one, however you want to interpret it. But that means the floodgates are open, which means I hope you can start traveling soon. And so we have a little bit of a fun uh, commercial that we've been airing right now, how Alaska Airlines cares and that we are uh, just that airline that has a little bit of fun while we're at it. So take a look at our little commercial. Cat Coalition, it's so good to see you all. I would like to start with a quick Roll call. Sunshine Bear. Care Bear in the care chair. Snuggy. Hi. Nick Cho. Hi, I'm your Korean dad. Mother Nature. Here and everywhere. Dog and Grandma. Here. All right, let's brainstorm. Any ideas for new members? I'd like to nominate Alaska Airlines. This neck pillow I'm dating says great things. Ooh, a caring airline? Wait, those exist? Well, we all believe in a talking sky bear. It says here they were the first airline to switch from plastic bottles to boxed water. Wow. They also hire a lot of people from caring professions. I'm seeing former teachers and nurses. Oh. OK, I'm loving the sound of all of this. Alaska Airlines, most caring airline. It's cute, right? We've never had an airline before. Ooh, this is a lot of pressure. Deep breath, sunshine bear, Ooh. like we practiced. It's settled. Alaska Airlines is officially in the running. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> Get your attention i don't know what will i mean it, it's got a little bit of everything it's got care bears throwback 80s to uh, mother nature happy earth month by the way uh to an uh, influencer to um tan france from uh you know uh from tv and, and beyond so anyways one of our fun little commercials alaska airlines is a caring airline and we're always giving back to our communities and that's Another reason why I wanted to support an event like this is we want to support our community, support our, support our small businesses, promote travel at the same time, and really get you back on planes healthy, safely, and exploring your favorite destination. So with that said, let's get into our first poll and kind of trivia question I want to ask each and every one of you as you get warmed up here today. Uh, which one of Alaska's One World Alliance partners uh, I mentioned that we joined the One World Alliance, but we can fly you all around the world through our partners. Just top of mind, would you go on British Airways? You know, you can take a look, fly to Europe, the Americas, Asia, Africa, Australia, and beyond. Maybe you want to check out Fin Air, go to the Finland or the Nordics, maybe Fiji Airways. Hey, let's get to the South Pacific. Uh, how about some island folks? Or maybe Iberia Airlines to Europe and Latin America. I'm just going to take a little quick poll to see where you'd like to go um, just to get a little pulse before we dive into our wonderful panelists as we explore Italy and the many flavors of that. Let's see. We'll give you guys a little bit of time. 
And uh, we really appreciate you tuning in because, yes, as Moss said, we're going to give away a pair of tickets anywhere Alaska Airlines flies in our network. And uh, we've been doing this pretty much for every session, every webinar. So let's see. What do the polls have to say? Ah, ha, ha, ha. the ones that have the most options. I, I get it. Europe, America's Asia kind of covers it all. British Airways been around a long time. Uh, great choice. And then number two, a distant two, Iberia Airlines. Yes, Europe, Latin America's. But it's all good. Either of these places, hope you can travel and enjoy. All right. Well, let's get back to uh, Voss in our program. Can't wait to dive right in. All right, I'm already hungry, guys. I hate to say it, <laughs> my mouth is watering. But uh, thank you, I want uh, Frank. I want to sincerely thank you for helping small businesses, highlighting our legacy new businesses and the amazing culture that we have in San Francisco. You can actually travel the world just within our seven by seven boundaries here. So it's we're very fortunate. Um, so again, thank you. Um, so before we begin um, our program, um, Dominic has a very special uh, video that he'd like to share. So take it away, Dominic. Dominic, you've outdone yourself. That's an amazing video. Definitely sets the mood. And we took an informal poll before the program started. Geographically, we're presenting, we're representing Italy nicely from the north, Lake Como, to Istria, to Trieste, to uh, Rome, and all the way to Calabria. So we're, we're demonstrating the whole geographic diversity of Italy in this very short program. So I want to sincerely thank our uh, panelists today. I know you guys are busy with your small businesses, but it's really important that we kind of take stock and appreciate what we have here in San Francisco. So first up, we've got uh, my friend uh, Francesco Cavucci from um, Il Casaro Pizzeria in uh, North Beach. However, before you start, Francesco, Dominic has a very fun video that he's going to present. So take it away, Dominic. <music> So um, just want to give a brief, brief uh, intro to Francesco. Francesco, one could say, is a serial entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> he's got two uh, Il Casaro pizzerias. He's got Barbara in North Beach, and he also has the California Fish Market in North Beach as well. The man is super busy, but um, I want to welcome you to the stage. Frank, Francesco, please tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, food memories, and what brought you to San Francisco and North Beach especially. So take it away, Francesco. Thank you, Vas. Thank you, Vas. Thank you, Franco. And thank you, Dominic, to prepare this. And thank you to Avnira. So my name is Francesco Covucci, and uh, I, was, uh, born, I was born and raised in Calabria, South Italy. I, I moved to United States and San Francisco in 2003. So my first uh, first city, San Francisco of the United States, and um, and uh, it came naturally to come uh, visit uh, North Beach. 
And uh, I guess uh, like so many Italian people that uh, they come to North Beach, they fall in love. And uh, North Beach is, uh, is a uh, great neighborhood full of Italian people and Italian merchants. Just like uh, he does that, uh, Papa Gianni, I was, you know, having espresso there almost um, every day. And I still do. And it's full of Italian people and uh, meeting a lot of the Italian, uh, you know, from uh, North Beach restaurant, Lorenzo Petroni. And uh, it's, in a great, uh, it's in a great community. And um, I was uh, a week after I arrived to San Francisco, actually I was hired as a busboy from uh, Macaroni restaurant. And, uh, you know, Mario, you know, he actually he armed me and they gave me a nickname, like an Italian culture, you know, after you met somebody, you give the nickname. So he said, Chicho, you start tomorrow as a busboy, you're the new busboy. So, and I start to work the following day. You know, I was the new best boy in my Caroni restaurant. And um, so I started this experience and I started to work just like, you know, the immigrant, uh, every immigrant life. He starts from a dishwasher or bus boy and uh, with the dream uh, to move up. And uh, my dream was to open a traditional Napolitan style pizzeria. And uh, the opportunity came and uh, we were be able to open El Casaro on uh, 2016, you know, with, uh, with uh, the idea and with the goal to keep the, to keep the Italian, uh, Italian community, to keep the the culture and the impact that the Italian community did to this neighborhood. So we want to keep everybody together and uh, we create an, uh, an a pizzeria with, uh, with a very, with a very approachable and uh, very affordable with uh, the same style that uh, and the same uh, approach that the pizzeria do in Italy. You go in a pizzeria, in Italy, you see a bunch of people having fun, drinking, and uh, so very, very casual. And uh, the goal of to El Casaro Pizzeria was uh, to um, have in uh, a pizzeria where everybody can enjoy easy access, uh, very affordable. And, um, and that's how I born El Casaro Pizzeria. We, we, we were uh, be able to bring a uh, wood burning oven from Italy and uh, cook the pizza in 90 seconds. You know, the people were, uh, we were going crazy. You know, when they see the pizza go inside the wood burning oven and cook in 90 seconds, they say, wow, can, can we cook another two, three minutes, five minutes? No, it's 90 seconds. And uh, everybody are amazed how, how the mozzarella and melts with the tomato sauce, with the olive oil, is a, you know, it's a magic 90 second. And uh, that's what is the Neapolitan, Neapolitan pizza is known for. And uh, that's uh, what we make here at uh, El Casaro. You know, after the first year, we make, you know, over 100,000 pizza a year. And, uh, and uh, is uh, again, is amazing how, you know, the pizza, we believe that the pizza should bring people together and to the table. And that's what a Casaro Pizzeria is known for. So a lot of people, a lot of fun, and um, that's, that's what we do. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Francesco. So in a nutshell, what is the, I, in this program, we have like a full spectrum of different pizzas that exist in Italy. And, What's amazing about Italy is it's a relatively small country, but there's a diversity in the cuisine. In a nutshell, how would you describe the uh, the the difference of a Napolitan Napolitano pizza? Uh, the Napolitan pizza is a pizza that again cooks in ninety second with uh, with a very within a wood burning oven, very high temperature, 
where uh, where when the outside is still a little bit crispy and a little bit of char from the wood burning the inside is a little bit chewy and wet and uh, you gotta be able to fold the pizza you know with your arm and uh, that's how that's what it makes a napolitan style pizza wonderful thank you so i think the the attendees on this program are going to have a nice overview of the uh, the plethora, the differences in pizza, um, depending what part of uh, Italy you're in. So um, thank you again, uh, Francesco. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, next up, we've got one of San Francisco's true amazing legacy businesses uh, called Cafe Trieste. You know, whole novels can be written on the history of this business. Uh, it's in the heart of North Beach totally fam family run and the the clientele is really amazing too it's such a spectrum of people community residents visitors um you know everybody's there it's such a beautiful uh canvas of people and it's great people watching as well i was there over the weekend um and of course the cappuccinos were amazing so um i'd like to introduce ida zubi um, she is the owner of cafe trias Thank you again. That was an awesome video, and I hope it whetted everyone's uh, taste to go to Cafe Trieste. So, Ida, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, tell us about Cafe Trieste. Well, thank you for having me, boss, and Franco and Dominic. I'm really honored to be here with this great panel of small business owners from North Beach and San Francisco. Um, I'm born in San Francisco. I'm the third generation owner together with my aunt, Adrian Jota. Um, Cafe Trez is 100% woman owned. And we've been in, we just celebrated our 66th year of business. My grandfather opened the cafe in 1956 when he came here post World War II from Italy with my grandmother, Ida, my mom, Sonia, my uncle, Don Franco. Um, my grandfather was a window washer when he came here, you know, saving his money and was able, had an opportunity to purchase and open this cafe. So he took it and he was working both jobs, cafe and window washing in the earlier years. And I mean, so much has happened, <laughs> you know, the cafe would be, you know, became basically like the living room of North Beach. And, you know, Francis Ford Coppola had worked on the Godfather screenplay and the beatnik generation hung out there. You know, it's been the cafe that's accepting the everyone and people feel so comfortable to come. It's all walks of life. I mean, you walk in there, you're gonna meet the artist, the writer, the lawyer, police officers, students. I mean, it's really a community place. And my grandfather really thought, you know, really wanted to open a coffee shop, a cafe, Italian style cafe and loved espresso and cappuccino culture and brought that here. So you know, we roast our own, own coffee in San Francisco. And uh, if you come to the cafe, you'll try, you know, we serve Italian roast espresso, it's our signature blend. And we use it for all our espresso drinks and house coffees. And uh, we have one of our signature drinks and we're that I wanted to bring on my uncle John Franco created back, I don't know what year, maybe Agostino would know. <laughs> it was a Cafe Fantasia. It was, a, it was chocolate, double espresso, or jacques, which is almond syrup, steam milk. It's really lovely. It's topped with hand whipped whipped cream. <laughs> you can get that. It's a great dessert drink after dinner or any time you know, in the day. In the mornings, people come in, get their cappuccinos, and Africano and it's not just about coming and have a coffee you come to have a coffee you see your friends there every day and it's it's really really you know become a staple in North Beach and North Beach as everyone sure if everyone knows is basically it's the little Italy of San Francisco and so many businesses 
have opened with the you know Italian you know culture behind it, different foods and drinks, and it's really important to just keep it going. Um, Ida, I was going to ask you, paint us a picture. What did North Beach look like in 1956? I know you weren't around. Well, but, uh, what, what, from what, photos, which are in black and white. <laughs> and, um, separate, what did North Beach look like? Look, it looked like there's people that were starting up and saw opportunity, a lot of small business owners and lots of mom and pop shops that, you know, the neighborhood supported that people, you know, it just, it's grew from there. I mean, it was before that as well, but, you know, it was a neighborhood and, you know, of opportunity. Interesting. And I know it was the, the birthplace of um, the beat generation uh, because you have so many other businesses that formed around this culture. And, yes. um, you know, it was, it, so it was this mix of uh, immigrants and also like original hipsters, right? From the fifties and sixties, right? Right. So, you know, and from my understanding, a lot of the writers, you know, you'd go and sit in a cafe for hours and it was okay. You know, some, not every business was accepting of that, you know, that that culture because it was more conservative back then and the beat generation came and you know had a lot to say uh, lots of beautiful writings and they gathered at the cafe you know we had jack kerouac eartha kitts jack hirschman you know and jack hirschman when he came from the east coast he came to the cafe and he you know took him some time to get on his feet and my aunt yolanda i mean she helped him she you know didn't charge him you know front it you know, took care of him until he get on his feet and, you know, you need a coffee, your pastry in the morning. And it's just, it's that kind of place. And, um, and they felt very, very comfortable there. And cause you know, there's something about, you know, I've talked to many writers and artists. They say, there's a feeling you get when you're at the cafe, that's very inspirational to them, especially a lot of new young artists that come in, they feel this energy from the past and it's pretty incredible. Yeah, I, I would agree. I was there this weekend and you can just feel the patina of history and culture. And, you know, we always say San Francisco is, is a city of outsiders and, um, you know, it's accepting of the beatniks and the, um, the summer of love, flower children and so many other groups, even the nerds today, the LGBTQ community. And um, I just want to thank you. And the, I, I want to pay respects to the culture of Cafe Trieste because you guys have upheld this tradition that we have here in San Francisco. So I, I hope all of you guys can go and, you know, taste Cafe Trieste soon. So thank you, Ida. Thank, thank you for you. presenting. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so hmm, next up, um, we've got our friend, uh, Mattia Marcelli from um, uh, Montesacro. Uh, he is the executive chef and partner at Montesacro, and Montesacro is an amazing pizzeria uh, restaurant. It's in the heart of downtown. to the stage. Uh, tell us a little about, about who Mattia is, your culinary history, and uh, what brought you to our beloved San Francisco. Yes, thank you, Vas, and thank you, everybody, for having me here. Uh, it's a true honor, uh, and it's a pleasure to represent all the small business here uh, with my colleagues, my Italian colleagues. Uh, my name is Mattia Marcelli. I was born and raised in Rome, Italy. Uh, I came to the United States uh, in 2009. My first stop was uh, New York City. So the reason why I came to America is actually uh, because of my business partner, Gianluca Le Grottaglie. So 
he was working uh, in a really successful Italian restaurant in New York City. Uh, I, was, I just finished uh, my school at the time, and uh, I was really looking for an experience, really looking for coming uh, out of uh, Italy. So I started talking to him, and he gave me the opportunity to stop by New York City for a few months and see how I feel, you know. This was a big step, you know, from Rome to New York City all by myself. Uh, after that, I spent two years in New York City. I was young, I saw, you know, I was missing my family. Uh, I decided to come back to Rome. I decided to come back to Rome because I was missing my family, I was missing my friends. And then after a few months spending it back in Rome, he moved back to San Francisco because I looked back. He was a partner here at Monte Sacro and Fifty for me. And after talking to him, I was back with the dream of uh, coming back to the United States. And this time I came back to San Francisco. So I started as a, as everybody, you know, I started as a line cook for the Fifty for Me restaurant. And then I became the two chef and then I became the executive chef. And now, since we opened uh, Monte Sacro, I'm the chef partner of both restaurants, 54 Meat and Monte Sacro, which is a co located in downtown San Francisco. And we are about to open uh, two different locations one in the Marina, and the other one would be Walnut Creek, with the same name of Monte Sacro. Uh, different from other kind of pizza, uh, Monte Sacro is a pizzeria. Uh, what is pizza? Everybody's asking. Is a pizza, is a bread. So it's an oval pizza, basically. Uh, instead of just being uh, wheat flour from uh, regular pizza, we have a mix of uh, soy, rice, and wheat. Uh, so it's a high percentage of water that we use. So on our recipe, we have like 90% of water, which is like uh, an incredible uh, product for basically a pizza that is cooked in a, on an oven. Uh, the difference is instead of being round, it's oval, and uh, basically it's a high proofing. So after we made the dough, we don't put it in the oven uh, soon. We let it rest at least uh, 72 hours. So the dough is really stretchable. As the word pizza, it's come from pincere, which is the uh, word for like stretching. So if you see a pizza dough, like you can really like stretch it like super easy. Uh, and it's an amazing product. So since it's high proofing, it's really light, it's crisp. Uh, it's it's not fulfilling as the other pizza. So after you ate one, you just wanna go ahead and eat another one right away. Uh, we opened Monte Sacro downtown uh, seven years ago, and since then it's been a challenge because the part of the city, you know, it's kind of tough. It's not an easy part of the city. That's why they name Monte Sacro. Because Monte Sacro is a neighbor in Rome where, you know, back in the days was kind of uh, a rough neighbor where there was a lot of, you know, not good people around. So we decided to give it a name. Uh, at first it was hard. You know, everybody was complaining about it, the situation. But we pushed it through, we pushed it through. And, you know, a lot of people are happy, you know, after you kind of have to wiggle around. And then when you enter Monte Sacro, it's like, you know, you are in Italy all of a sudden without, without a plane ticket, you know. And uh, we try to be this authentic Italian experience. We don't have a full kitchen in Monte Sacro at the downtown location. So we have the pizza oven and then we have a charcuterie salad uh, bar where we do all our charcuterie cheeses, uh, mostly imported from Italy, some local, some international and uh, has been a successful season. Excellent, Mattia. And I just want to share, um, you know, walking into uh, Monte Sacro, it's a very transformative experience because you come from this urban outside world, then you go inside and you're immediately enveloped with uh, so much history and, you know, so much uh, texture and colors. And, you know, it's, uh, you really want to stay there all, all day long, all night long. And do you still have the upstairs uh, roof dining area so, too? So we used it upstairs for the pandemic. And uh, after that, we had some trouble with the owner of the building. So we decided to leave it for now. Uh, even because our size of the kitchen is really small, it sometimes would be becoming like really difficult to 
to basically take care of the outside or the indoor and the upstairs was, was becoming challenging. So let's say I come to your restaurant, I don't know what to order. What, what do you recommend to order? What, what is a classic Montesacro? Classic Montesacro. I mean, one of my favorite things, it's called uh, focaccia del muratore, which is basically a, a, a round pizza. It's a, basically a focaccia that we cut in the half and we stuff it with a mortadella. That's it. You know, in Rome, it's like a typical lunch snack, like from the muratore, from the guy that they work in constructions. That's basically what they used to eat. Basically a bread with a mortadella inside. And for me, it's like one of my favorite things in the whole world. Like when I'm hungry and I'm Monte Sacro, that's what I eat. But, you know, you can go, you cannot go wrong with our pizza. You know, it really depends about, that's why like people always ask me like, oh, what's the best things on the menu? I'm like, depends about your mood. You can have everything on the menu. You can like everything, but I really like, what would you like to eat? Fantastic. No, it's, I, I, I want to congratulate you guys because you guys have created such an amazing experience when you walk in and also the service is great and um the selection is different you know and that's what's great about san francisco we have such a nice uh range of uh representing the different regions of italy and different cuisines so i want to thank you for uh giving this gift to the city thank you, no, thank you guys <laughs> and of well, course Gianluca it. too so it's a pleasure, you know, we focus on Roman cuisine, but Monte Sacro is a little bit more of a fun place. You know, we have wine uh, from all over the place. We have cheese and salumi from all over the place. You know, even being local, it's important to us and bringing like a uh, top quality ingredient. Excellent, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mattia. Thank you thank for you joining guys. us today, grazie. So um, finally, we have one of my favorite restaurants in the city, uh, Tommaso's. But uh, before we continue with uh, the owner, Agustino, we have a very nice video to share with you. Agustino, grazie. Thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor. Um, every time I go to Tommaso's, it's such a great experience. The food, I really feel like I'm part of the family. I don't even know the family that well, but I really feel very welcome. And uh, of course, the food speaks for itself. It's amazing. And this is a true legacy business. I believe you told me uh, it was started in 1935, but I'll let you tell us the whole story. But um, thank you for everything. Sincerely, thank you. And thank you for joining us today. And welcome to the stage. Unmute yourself, though. Bravo. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Agostino Crotti. I'm the proprietor of uh, Tommaso's restaurant. Uh, this restaurant is uh, 86 years old. Back in 1935, the Cantalupo family from Naples, they shortened their last name Cantalupo to Lupo, and they called this place Lupo from 1935 until 1971, when uh, after many years in business, they decided to give it up and they gave it to their longtime cook, a guy by the name of Tommy, who was in the kitchen for 25 years. They gave him the business, but not the name. So Tommy the cook, Italianized his name Tommy into Tommaso, which is Italian for uh, Tommy, obviously. And uh, when we bought the place from him two years later in 1973, we decided not to change the name again. That's why the place is called Tommaso's today. Uh, one of the main features in the restaurant is the brick oven. And the reason I mentioned this is because it's the oldest oven on the West Coast. That was the first oven built back in 1935 by the Cantalupo family. Uh, we use oak wood, which is the best type of wood for this type of cooking due to the fact that it yields very high heat and very low flame, perfect for cooking the pizza. Interestingly, when the Alice Water of Chepanis opened the cafe upstairs in the early 70s, 
she sent the brick layer to get the design of the oven from us. And then she gave it to Spago in LA. So everything sort of started here. Uh, there is a lot of history behind the restaurant. Back in the 30s and 40s, the like of uh, Bob Hope and Jack Webb and Betty Davis, Julia Child, the Frank Sinatra and the Max Brothers, they used to come up from LA to spend the weekend in San Francisco. And Lupo's was one of their favorite hangouts. So we have a lot of history there. One of my first job when I first came, I came in 1969. In 1970, a few months after I arrived from, uh, I, I grew up in Rome actually, even though I was born in the Lake Como area of Northern Italy. One of my first job was a barista at the Cafe Trieste. And I have uh, very happy memories of that. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Francis Coppola. Was, he was, uh, like Ida said, like uh, the script of The Godfather was written there. He had a little Oliverti typewriter and I used to bring him cappuccino every so often and we became very good friends. And over the years, we opened up this place for private parties, kids' birthdays, movie gathering, wine tasting, and so forth. Make a long story short, when uh, Newsweek magazine came out with a lengthy article after The Godfather's success, they published a picture of Francis Coppola making his own pizza in front of our oven. So we are family operated. My sister, Carmen, she's my partner. I work with my son, Giorgio, my wife. And, uh, you know, now we had the place for 50 years ourselves. And uh, who knows, after 86 years, uh, maybe we can reach 100 and we'll see what happens. That is that's beautiful. Thank you, Agostino. My pleasure. Um, I'm sure many people have been to Tommaso's, but if you haven't been, it's such a great experience. It's uh, slightly subterranean, right? So you walk down and you're immediately transported into this other space. It's very um, womb-like. It's a womb-like space. And then the, <laughs> the, 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 the oven, the pizza oven, it's like, it's like a throne, you know, and, uh, it's it's um it's very communal, but it's also very private too because you have the booths, right? So right, we have a communal table in the middle, which sits about eighteen people together, and then we have the semi-open booths on the side for more privacy and everything. Interestingly, the the murals on the walls are, are from Naples and vicinities, and they were painted in 1935 when the place opened. And the rumor is that a local artist did it and they was paid with spaghetti and meatballs. True story. I love it, I love it. Um, yeah, and the family's awesome too. I mean, they really make you feel at home. Um, and actually last mm -hmm. time I was there, uh, Governor Brown was having his birthday party there. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's been a fan for many years. He had his birthday party here for the past 20 years or so. and. Uh, and every time he comes to town, he always comes and visits us. So we are, we are very fortunate. That's wonderful. Um, so thank you again, Agostino. Thank you for sharing your, your legacy and your continued legacy and your family history. It's very special. Thank you again. Um, thank you. So be yeah, my pleasure. So before we continue, we've got a special poll, another poll to share uh, from Alaska Airlines. So take it away, Franco. Wow, I love it. Uh, I love just uh, hearing all the insights and sharing all this uh, wonderful culture. I'm, I'm like I, I like boss said, I'm getting ready to eat. It's about that time, uh, right? When's dinner? Uh, but anyways, let's get a little poll here. You know, hopefully inspired some food. Uh, maybe thinking about travel and whatever it may be. Uh, but food is at the epicenter of what we're talking about here. So let's get a taste of Italy here. Let's ask all of you. Which of these Italian favorites would you pick if you could only pick one? Just one. This is going to be hard, uh, but I know you can do it. Risotto alla Milanese or spaghetti alla carbonara, Neo, uh, Neapolitan pizza, or maybe some also buco. Whatever you would like. Mm -hmm. I want select all. Is there a button that says select all? I cannot. <laughs> we can't. So we have to pick one, folks. Just one. Um, but I, this sounds like a great dinner plan right about now. So let's see what we got. What are we in the mood for? Oh, man, we got some close ones. But the leading one, you can't go wrong with some Neapolitan pizza. 
Hey, that is the, you know what? I, I think everybody can go with that. You know, any time of day, morning, noon, or night, by the way, uh, I can eat pizza every day of the week, but Hey, the crowd has spoken. All right. So let's get back to it. I love it, Voss. Let's do this. And of course, finish off that great meal with the great espresso from Cafe Trieste. So that's the finishing touch. Um, so folks, we're going to start the Q&A section now. Um, it's going to be super brief, but if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A section. Um, you know, food is such a unifier. It just brings people from different cultures together. And uh, we have such fond memories of our food because it represents family, culture, our country, our history. And um, I just want to pose this question to our panelists. Mattia, what is the fondest food memory that you have? Where did you have it? And who prepared it for you? And possibly, like, how did it affect what you do now? So my, my memory is about food. Uh, it's about the Sunday morning. So I, I remember my mom waking up extra early because on Sunday in Italy, at least back in the days, nobody was going to work. So it was a day where like people were gathering together and eat. I remember my mom make the sugo. So sometimes we beef, sometimes we pork, you know, whatever she was getting. And I remember cooking the sugo for hours and hours. And I was waking up uh, Sunday morning, like nine, 10 o'clock in the morning with uh, the smell surrounding my apartment with all this sugo. So I remember just, you know, instead of having a typical Italian breakfast with like uh, two pieces and cappuccino or milk, I was getting in the kitchen, cutting myself a piece of bread, getting the spoon from the kitchen and put the, uh, the sugo on top of the bread, or even worse, dipping the bread in the sugo. And then my mom uh, was, you know, was gonna come after me with the cucchiarella, with the wooden spoon you know, like uh, chasing me around the house. So that, that's what like uh, shaped me about food, about, you know, it's about simplicity, about good food and about making uh, food we love. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful picture. Um, who's next? Ida, tell us about your memorable food experience. Actually, very similar Sunday mornings. We, my bedtime, you know, my father would wake me up. He was already has a couple focaccia done in the kitchen. And he'd tell me, come on, you know, I had, I'd help him make the fresh pasta, he had the little, you know, little machine on the kitchen table and rolling it out. Uh, Sundays we would have family over, have my aunt and uncle and my cousin over. And it was really great, you know, it's just, and I'm laughing when we was talking about the wooden spoon. I think every Italian house had the wooden spoon. So. <laughs> you know, it's uh, and, and it used for memory. different purposes. <laughs> you better listen. No, that's wasn't. I know my mom's watching. Mom, I'm just kidding. So, but um, definitely Sundays and you know, Sunday dinner and getting preparing it. I'm just curious. In a traditional Italian Italian American household, what time is Sunday dinner? Five or six. I mean, that's when we ate because. Everyone woke up really early the next morning, go to work. Got it. Got it. I mean, it wasn't a quick dinner either. You know, it's all the different courses and after and the grappa comes out and the little Neapolitan coffee pot came out. I mean, this went on for hours. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you, Ida. Uh, Francesco, tell us, share your food memories with us. Oh, well, I, you know, the, the tomato sauce is a classic, but uh, I, I was, I was amazed and, and uh, impressed when, you know, I was walking in the small kitchen of my mom and see flour, water, few eggs, and, uh, and an hour later, you know, several pounds of homemade pasta, ravioli, fusilli, you know, that, that was just like, you know, what is the tiny food? You start with flour and water, and you get a meal for a dozen of people and family, you know, hour later. I think that's the translation of, uh, of the Italian, uh, the Italian food, the Italian culture abroad the world everywhere. You start with flour and water and you get, you know, an, uh, an a meal for everybody. Just started with, uh, you know, flour and water and when, when it's needed, some eggs. Yeah. 
That's... Amazing, amazing. The the resourcefulness and what you can do with just flour, water, and, and some eggs. And, and two hands. And two hands. hands. Amazing, amazing. I think we all secretly want to have an Italian family and just share the good, the bad, and the ugly. But anyway, share that amazing meal all together. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Francesco. Agostino, share your favorite food memory with us. Uh, being from Northern Italy, uh, like I said before, Lake Como area, not far from Milan, risotto was my grandma's favorite dish. And she used to do the classic one with the saffron and the porcini mushrooms. So that's uh, one of my first memories of, as a child. Later on, my sister Lydia, who was the executive chef at the restaurant here for many years, she did uh, the lasagna uh, that was described by some critics uh, as uh, cutting into a pillow with a fork. That's how delicious and uh, soft and beautiful that was. And of course, being in the pizza business, I also enjoyed that, but that came later in life because uh, where we come from up north, pizza was not popular. Of course, I discovered it here when I came to San Francisco in 1973 and I got into business and so forth. But those are the best memories of, uh, of my youth as far as food is concerned. That's so beautiful. Thank you, thank you. And you know, in any cuisine from around the world, there's always that food item that's um, ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And maybe with Italy, it's pizza. That's the thing that people uh, latch on to, and then they want to discover risotto and also buco and all this other stuff and learn more about the culture of the people. So um, that's a fascinating thing. Anyway, uh, but we have a few questions and our time is kind of running out. But um, Esper had a question for you, Ida. Does Cafe Trieste have live music? Yes, we do. Um, we would usually have it, we have it the first Saturday every month, we have our Saturday concerts, they are still outside, we haven't moved back in yet, but it's still continuing. Um, we have music on first Fridays in the evening, and then sporadically, like on Sunday mornings, we'll have the mandolins come in, and on Saturday mornings, we have different groups come in, so yes, we definitely still have live music, so, but for sure, first Saturdays of the month from one to four. You'll know, find David Sturdivant, Ron Sparso, Marianne Sparso, my mom Sonia will be there singing and stop by. <laughs> really? I didn't know yes. that. Wow. So that's every Sunday? Every Saturday, every first, uh, sorry, first Saturday every month. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. That's a party right there. Been going on uh, for years. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Excellent. So my friend Nish had a question for you guys, and um, I would like for all of you to answer this question. What is your favorite wine to pair with your pizzas? So, um, Francesco, you're, you're first. Well, it depends which pizza, but uh, if, uh, you know, I, I enjoy myself a nice falangina, nice glass of falangina, can't get wrong with that. Yeah, Terra Stregata, falangina from Campania, from our friend, the winemaker Filomena. That's a, that's a good pair, Nish, and, and thanks for joining, Nish. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think this will be a segment that we all need to be taking copious notes because this is good information because <laughs> you got to have wine. Um, Mattia, tell us, what kind of wine would you have with your food? Ah, uh, that's, as, as Francesco was saying, you know, that's a good question because you always have to see what you're going to eat, you know, if I if I'm gonna eat my focaccia del muratore, the focaccia di mortadella, I will go with a nice glass of Lambrusco from Emilia Romagna. That will fare really, really well. Excellent. Very good. And um, Agostino, tell us. Well, my answer is very simple. I tell you, the best wine we sell here is our own label. It's a Tommaso's label and it's produced exclusively for us by the Pedroncelli family in Sonoma, and it's a blend of Merlot, Zinfandel, and Syrah, absolutely divine. And uh, it, I tell you, it goes with everything we serve here. That's my wow. answer. That, that's what I want to hear. I just want to have one wine, and I order it for everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
<laughs> Ida, tell us what's what's your favorite wine? Wine and coffee, they go well together, right? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> well, one before the other, of course. <laughs> one to wake you up after all the wine. Um, my favorite wine with any meal or just with pizza? Let's, let's talk about, yeah, okay, with pizza. I do actually really enjoy Tommaso's red wine. I've had it there. It's excellent. And it goes with, like, I've had so many different dishes there. It always goes very well. Excelente. Good, good, good. And my friend Liz is asking the question, are these restaurants open for lunch during the week? Um, of course, Cafe Trieste is open. You also have uh, sandwiches too, right? It's not just pastries yes. and yeah, you also have savories. Yeah. So we have that sandwiches can, that... and salads and we're open 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. Right. That's a good option because you, you would have a complete meal at Cafe Trieste. You, you can sit cannoli. outside or inside. <laughs> yeah, the cannoli is good. You were sold out this Sunday. Oh, really? Anyway, that's a good sign. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, Agostino, tell us, um, are you open for lunch? No, the restaurant is open for dinner only from 5 to 10. We are not open for lunch. As I said, the place has been here 86 years, never open for lunch. Wow, oh, God bless. That's awesome. Uh, Francesco, you yes. open for lunch? Yes, we, we open every day, 11.30 to 10 p.m. and uh, Friday and Saturday, 11.30 to midnight. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mattia, are you open for lunch? Yeah, we open seven days a week for lunch and dinner from 11.30 to 10.30. Wow. Amazing, amazing. Wow, that's excellent. So finally, we have a question from Judy. Um, what about pastry at Cafe Trieste? <laughs> Ida, what about pastry? What about pastries? Shared, right? <laughs> Come <laughs> early on a huge selection. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, those uh, cannolis really caught my eye. Cannolis are great and the almond rings are amazing. Excellent. Yes. So, um, and Nicole, thank you for your comment. She said, I fully enjoyed listening to the backstories, history of each restaurant. Are they available on each restaurant website? Are they available on each? Um, the history and the, yeah, you, you guys have very extensive websites, right? So it has all that information there. And um, I might add that you're all very active on uh, Instagram as well. So um, if you want to get more information on the restaurants, please go to the uh, Instagram pages too. But uh, Franco, um, you need to share who is our winner for today's uh, tickets on the Alaska Airlines. All right, this is the moment I've been waiting for. So here we are, we are gonna pick one winner and we appreciate you tuning in uh, virtually here. Hopefully this inspires you to get out there and uh, grab a bite at our wonderful partners, restaurants here or uh, anywhere in the city. As Voss said, you can explore the city seven by seven, literally go around the world if you want to. Um, but we want you to go around the world on Alaska. However, uh, around the world with Alaska Airlines, um, is really our Alaska Airlines network, which you'll have two round trip tickets anywhere we fly. We do fly domestically uh, throughout the US uh, and then also parts of Mexico and go to Hawaii, of course. Costa Rica is an international destination. Belize is a new one as well, parts of Canada. Uh, but you have to travel on our One World partners if you wanna go globally to Italy or Europe or Asia or wherever you want to go. So hopefully you can check out alaskaair.com to find out more information about that but let's get to our winner virtual drum roll please uh, all right the winner randomly selected thanks for tuning in two round trip tickets anywhere alaska flies no blackout dates travel good for up to two years goes to looks like gina borelli gina Bravo. Hey, Gina. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Gina. And uh, wow, hopefully you can get out there mask free and travel the country or any of our great destinations on Alaska Airlines. Congrats, Gina. Thank you, Franco. You're the best. Thank you.
And uh, Gina, we have your contact info. We're going to email you. We'll introduce you to the Franco. And then uh, you'll get your tickets uh, straight away. And I also have some winners to some of our participating restaurants today. Uh, so uh, for Cafe Trieste, it's Lynn Russell. Lynn, we have your info. We'll, share, we'll make the intro after the program is over. And um, for Tomasos, we've got Nicole Pantaleo. Nicole Pantaleo. We have your info. <laughs> Congratulations. And for Il Cazaro, we've got Paul Bracco. Um, congratulations, uh, Paul. And we'll be reaching out to you soon after the program is over. Um, so, wow. So we are right at time. Um, listen, I just want to thank you guys for coming on. I want to thank our we had a fantastic discussion. I hope we learn more about culture, food, and these small businesses that play an integral part to the vitality of San Francisco, this amazing city that we call San Francisco. Um, as you can see, it's appropriate that the Phoenix is a symbol of San Francisco. The city is alive as well. It's coming back to life. And you small businesses are playing a huge part in that. And I've been all over the city since restrictions were lifted. And uh, definitely people are enthused. They want to come out. They want to enjoy the neighborhood corridors, the restaurants, and the culture that we have here. So please go out, enjoy our neighborhoods, um, bring new friends, make new friends. And uh, it's important to do this now, especially because unfortunately, a lot of our visitors, our tourists are not, they're not back in the city in the numbers that they once were. So these businesses are really depending on you guys um, for your business. And I want to sincerely thank Alaska Airlines. Franco, thank you so much. You've been such a great small business advocate. You've shown us so much support and just amplifying the faces and the voices of our small businesses. And that's why we're highlighting these unique neighborhoods and small businesses, because they're beacons of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, thank you again. And as they say in Italy, uh, ci vediamo presto. And uh, we'll see you in one of these amazing restaurants.